Welcome, everybody, to Let's Talk Computer Science, a podcast dedicated to talking about the past, present, and future of computer science. This podcast is made possible by our friends at Rex Academy. Be sure to check out their amazing CS platform, including courses on cybersecurity, app development, and, of course, everybody's buzzword, AI. Don't have a CS teacher? Not a problem. Rex is now providing instructors as part of their platforms. You can actually get virtual teachers with their platform, which is pretty awesome. Be sure to check them out at rex.academy. And today, I'm excited to have on the show to Dr. Leanne Delizer. And I believe, Leanne, you've been on the show before. She's the executive director of cs for all but uh, I'm going to have her explain that. But before she does, Leanne, tell me, what is your origin story? What got you excited about CS? Like, what was there a moment in time where you're like, boom, this is it? Well, I think that that's like a really loaded question. And uh, <laughs> un- unlike many people of my generation who are in computer science, it was not video games. There was, oh, there was there's no the, buried moment. the lead right there. Yeah. Yeah. There was no moment when I was young um, where computers were like the thing in my life that I wanted to do. Uh, I grew up in a log cabin my father built on a mountain in upstate New York. Uh, we didn't even have like regular TV. Like if you wanted to see, you had one of those like antennas, you could oh, yeah. clean out like the bedroom window and like try and like turn it. Stay off, right like, there while I watch you. Yeah. But if you wanted to watch Channel Four, you had to like swing it all the way around the other way to get Channel Four. Um, so you know, devices and screens weren't a whole lot of my upbringing, um, and what really happened was I think. Uh, the reason I do this work at cs for all has very little actually to do with the computer science and much more to do with the fact that I was a pretty, you know, smart young woman in rural America. And like many smart young women in rural America, that meant I was going to be everybody's favorite math teacher when I grew up. Yay. Yes. That's what you had to look forward that's to. That's what I had to look forward to. Well, because <laughs> that was like teaching was the thing for young women. Right. Right. And if you were super smart, then you could be a STEM teacher. Right. You were going to be a science teacher or a math teacher, um, maybe a history teacher. If you lived lived a little more in the humanities space. Right. If you were artsy, you were going to be everybody's favorite art teacher. Um, And I remember like my dad was a truck driver. uh, And during my late high school years, he was an out of work truck driver. Mm. And I remember going to my high school guidance counselor my senior year and asking for a book of scholarships because I knew that there was no way that he was going to be able to pay for college for me. Right. Um, And uh, she looked at me and she went, you want to go to college? (laughs) And in that, in that moment, I knew that, you know, that I was going to have to do it myself. Yeah. And years later, uh, having become a math teacher And first teaching in South Florida, so in Broward County, my first teaching job was at Stranahan High School in Broward County. Um, I paid for a lot of my undergraduate degree by working for different departments on campus. Nice. And they kind of figured out that I wasn't bad at computing. I actually ended up building database systems for different departments. And in the summer- Just for fun. Well, no, they paid me. Let's let's be clear. It was work. That's good. Um, It paid my tuition and it paid everything. Uh, and I had a computer science minor because as a math education major, Pace University required you take two programming classes. And so I was like, well, why don't I just finish out the minor? And uh, when I started teaching, the school was like, we need someone to teach computer applications. And so my first teaching job was four sections of computer applications and uh, one section of pre-calculus. I got out of bed in the morning for that pre-calculus class. Wow. Um, And then I started teaching advanced placement computer science and programming and started to do like really fun things with kids and code. Uh, Moved back to New York and taught for eight years, uh, actually the town over from where I live now in Bedford, New York. Ran a robotics club, uh, 40 kids on the robotics team, a third of them girls. Uh, And really just kind of leaned into this notion that, you know, I found computing later in life, but maybe not everybody else uh, needed to wait so long. Right. That there there were fun and cool things. Um, And to your earlier point about AI, right? In the 90s, I was teaching my kids 
how to teach a computer to play blackjack. Artificial intelligence. Yes. Um, not through a bunch of algorithms where it's like, here are the rules of blackjack, but literally sure. from having them play, from having the computer play blackjack 2000 times and then deciding based on the history of the games it played, whether it should hit or stay. So the computer literally was doing a learning, a Bayesian learning algorithm um, way back in the 90s. Uh, there was this great book about the development of a checkers AI that I used to mm. make all of my students read because I found it to be the perfect intersection of data and coding. And as I said, I paid for my own undergraduate degree by building database systems. So data has always been such a core part about the way I think about the power of computing, even before big data really became a thing now that we use in the world quite so much. Um, I, you know, I was everybody's favorite computer science and math teacher. The kids called me CompSci mom, and it got to the point where... <laughs> CompSci mom, I love that. Well, that if you had remember? a kid yeah. in my computer science class and you were another teacher, your first call wasn't home to that kid's parent. <sighs> A lot of times it was me because they were hanging out in my classroom at lunchtime. It was a safe space to be. They were hanging out in my classroom after school. They were on the robotics team or the programming team. And so if they weren't doing what they needed to do in another class, I literally had them basically in a, you know, de facto after school program. And I'd be like, listen, you got to go and do your social studies homework, right? I could reroute them back into their other classes. Um, I wrote a couple of textbooks um, from that classroom. I was on the board of directors of the Computer Science Teachers Association and really got engaged with uh, what do teachers need to learn? How do you get a teaching workforce that inspires kids? How do I share the cool things that I was doing in my classroom with others? And then for these teachers that I was meeting around the country as I was going to CSTA events and others, you know, what, is it, what would it really take to support that? How do you build infrastructure to really make sure that teachers have what they need? And I went to Carnegie Mellon first. I would say I did it backwards. I was there first as a graduate student. Uh, sorry, first as a professor, and then they let me in as a graduate student. That's, that's yeah, the back way in. I like that. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> my first semester there, I had all of this imposter syndrome, um, like, why the heck was Carnegie Mellon letting me teach computer science in their department, in their computer science department, right? This is the number one computer science. Carnegie department. Mellon, I know. That's right? a, it's super prestigious, yes. Yeah. Um, and it was mostly because I don't sit quietly in rooms and used to grade AP exams with all their professors. <laughs> 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 and I do I all the time with people, if you want to get a perfect score on the math GREs, right, which went a long way in convincing them that I could hack it, teach pre-calculus for a decade yeah. because the math GREs are all pre-calculus. So literally yes. I was going through the GRE and I'm like, Oh, I'm like I used to teach that in November. Oh, I remember using that distractor answer on a question just like that. <laughs> right. That's true. Yeah. So, you learned the material well by teaching it. Yes. Yeah. So anybody who wants to like do an amazing job on the math series, just volunteer in a pre-calculus <laughs> classroom or like tutor pre-calculus for a few years. You'll be fine. Just a few years, yeah. Well, you got to go through the content more than once, right? That's true, because you don't. The first couple of years, it's always like eh, trial and error, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I was at CMU um, and uh, came back to New York. Uh, started helping spin up computer science themed high schools in New York City, and then New York City's computer science initiative, really to reach every kid in New York. Um, as you can imagine, New York City is nothing if not scale. Yeah. So we're talking 1.1 million kids across 1,700 schools in one city. Um, I mean, it makes Broward County look tiny. And Broward County is huge uh, in Florida where you were talking before. So yeah. that's I to scale all that out, I can't imagine. I mean, first of all, I love your, your entire backstory up to this point. Cause it's, it aligns a lot with mine, same kind of thing, only not the female living in the rural. I'm more the male, but you know, elementary school teacher here that everyone's like, Oh, you can't, you're a male. Why are you teaching elementary? You should be a football coach teaching history, right. but also a math major also loved CS the back way. I doesn't like into it right away. I did coding like you did, but, um, 
uh, it's interesting. How, what CS for all though, you know, get, get us to that point. Tell us about yeah. CS for all. First of all, what got you, what got you motivated you there? And then what is it exactly? Like, give us kind of like the one minute elevator pitch. Yeah, it grew directly out of the work from New York City. So what we learned in New York was that you, you couldn't pick one answer because one thing wouldn't fit everywhere. There was no one answer that was going to solve the entirety of New York City. Right. And that the biggest change that had to happen was the system had to change. It wasn't about one classroom or one teacher because nickel and diming one classroom, one teacher, just like it wasn't possible. Right. And so when President Obama made a call for computer science education in 2016, um, not a lot of people know this, but the four billion dollar number he put on that initiative was New York City times the nation. He took our model in New York City and said, what would it take to do that across the nation? Um, And we felt like what we had done in New York City, because it was one of the few initiatives where we didn't pick one answer, could truly be scaled. And so we launched CS for All as a national initiative built on this work of not picking a a winner, but leaning into true systems change uh, in order to provide access to measure participation in and hold schools accountable for students' experience within computer science classrooms across the landscape. That, that whole, that systems change. Let's focus on that for a second, because I feel like that's key. Most people that listen to this, they're, they're either looking to get into computer science or maybe they have a passionate teacher that wants to do it. But a lot of the systems themselves yeah. aren't making that change. And it sounds like you took a measure of accountability, but also variability because you said it wasn't one single answer for every school, obviously in New York with at one point, whatever million kids. So talk about that. How, what are, how do you truly help schools and systems change? Because the pandemic's sort of changed some things, but then we kind of sort of went back to some tried and true methods and now we've got AI and now that's going to maybe change things. And yes, next year it'll be something else I'm sure. But uh, so how, besides these external things, how do you truly have internal system change? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, to go to your point about AI, there's something AI can teach us in this moment. Um, The whole way that, that generative AI works, right. Is it finds patterns within the noise. Right? It takes this amazing corpus that it's been fed as input, whether it be data or pictures, right? things like Dali and others, and it says, what in response to this prompt, what would I do next? What's the pattern here that I can figure out what the next step is? When we talk about systems change and you know, not just change but reform because we're trying to move it towards an end goal, we have to take a look at the patterns of the system. And so I like to say there are three components to every system. Systems have people, they have practices or routines, and they have policy. Right. And we so often just focus on the people or the policy. So we're like, we need more teachers. We're going to provide teacher professional learning. Right. Throw money at it. Yes. Oh, well, the throw money at it's the policy. We're going to give so much money for this, or we're going to require a graduation credit. But the, the breakdown in the practices is really where we lose students in this context of access for all. If we don't constantly ask ourselves, are we doing what we set out to do? Are we truly reaching that young girl in rural America who might have a technologically inclined brain, right? Are we giving that student from the Bronx like clear and real access, or are we pulling him out of his class, his computer science class for language learning opportunities because he might speak Spanish as a first language, right? If we're not constantly interrogating what it is we're doing, I don't think we're going to keep moving towards that finish line because one, All of the people doing this work are humans. Humans are imperfect. Absolutely. We learn and we grow. And this is like computer systems too, right? When you build a system, every single person who builds a computer system knows that the first thing you have to do is debug it. Right. (laughs) Right? And so how are we using routines of debugging with the humans? And the same thing with our policies. A lot of people talk about policy and unintended consequences. How are we debugging the policies? And so those routines 
are a key piece of us making sure that we are actually doing what we set out to do um, and not just be like, oh, I sent a teacher to PD. Check. Right. Check a box. Right. Oh, we put money in the bank for computing. Check. Check. Yep. Graduation credit. Check. Yep. Right. We need those routines. And CS for All is built on that notion of collaborative, collective action. Who are the stakeholders who need to be at the table, the voices that need to be heard? My senior director of programs and partnerships, Candy Belgrave, is always, always advocating for parents and students to have a seat at that table. Yes. Right? And then turning that not only into decisions or policy, but also routines that help us debug the things that we're putting on the ground and make improvements so that when something like AI comes along, those routines allow for the schools to adjust and adapt because there's already this, how are we doing? What's the next thing? How do we dig in? Right? I love the debugging of human. That's a... That's... <laughs> There's a lot of us that need a lot of debugging. I'll just say that. Um, but when you talk about these systems, where is where is CS for all? Where are you focusing most of your energy? Is it rural? Is it urban? Is it in, in diversity, equity, and inclusion? Where do you feel like, or is it is it all of the above? Are you spreading out as far like you said because it's so vari- so many varieties of systems out there? Yeah. Um, so there's a, a long tail for education um, for size of institution that I don't think a lot of people recognize. There are about 15 to 16,000 local education agencies, school districts, um, private schools, uh, charter schools and networks, right? So about 15 to 16,000, it's kind of, it changes a lot. Um, Two fifths of the kids in the United States go to 100 of them. Wow. (laughs) Right? That's concentrated, yeah. Yeah, right? So there's this huge, like, bubble of kids at the beginning and then actually by number most of the schools in the United States look a lot like the one that I went to I graduated with 50 kids in my entire I, senior I class. had 22 in my senior class I'm with you yeah right and so how we're trying to think about it from a yes those hundred districts right are often some of the most under-resourced because just of sheer volume of kids right. that flow through them, right? So that's one way that they need care, support, investment. But to your point, when you say rural, it's not just rural, it's rural and small. And so the wiggle room that they have in a budget to do anything new. Think about New York City, adding one new teacher within a city budget was like, less than a half of a half of a 1%, right? right? But if you think about that rural school that you and I went to, adding one new teacher is a significant portion of that annual budget, right? And so the problems of, of resourcing and the opportunity for models to make change look really different. And so at CS for All, we have a program called SCRIPT, where we do strategic planning with school districts. We lean in really hard to what are the assets that each of those different kinds of schools have, right? So what are the assets that are actually in those small schools? What are the assets that are in those big schools? And then how do you take computer science and you build off your asset as opposed to having someone else come in and say, oh, well, you need to hire a CS teacher. You need to do this model that we see. Um, And so we really think about computer science as a mechanism for school reform and improvement, not the other way around. Because computer science should be in schools to serve society and citizenship. Not citizenship and society should somehow serve this technological beast that underlies everything. I love that. And I think we're in the middle of a, of a deep conversation around that as we get to this final question about AI. And we, you've mentioned a little bit about it, kind of helping with some of those big data problems. What do you see as, you know, put a future future hat on here? I mean, this is, I don't think this is a blip. It's not just a trend. It's going to be with us. And it's been with us, like you mentioned, a long time ago. In fact, you know, 1951 was the first time that, you know, a professor in Oxford developed some sort of artificial intelligence with a computer system that was the size of, you know, a house at the time. Um, how, how do you see generative AI impacting or inflecting on computer science? Is it that coding will become 
less important or more important, or you'll still need to be able to debug, I would imagine, because like if anybody's done anything with generative AI, there's so many hallucinations and so many things that it does wrong still. Um, what's What do you think the impact will be? If you think about over the last 100 years, how transportation, the ability to move a human from one place to another has changed, right? Um, automobile, bicycles, automobiles, trains, planes, right? Does it mean that people no longer walk? No, there are things that we do better on our own two feet than through some kind of mechanized conveyance. Am I going to walk from here to California? No, no. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> so I'm not gonna have to walk from here to California. We've produced a better way for that to happen. And what's going to happen in terms of the way AI is going to impact our workforce is we are going to find better ways to travel those distances. The things that used to take humans a lot of time to basically just like put one foot in front of the other, that's going to get taken care of by the AI. But you know what that means? I'm going to have more time to dance. I love it. Or I'm going to choose to run for exercise, right? Or I'm going to walk around my house because it's easier and better than riding a little like motorized skateboard around it. And we're going to figure out, right? And now cities are building walking centers in the center of cities, like carless zones, um, because there's a certain feature to people walking, that contributes to that piece of society in that space. And so we're gonna find that yes, there's gonna be lots of places where AI is gonna take over doing things for us, just like planes and trains and automobiles did. But we're also gonna find our ability to say, well, where is it beneficial for us to take the lead? How are we gonna bring our creativity? In what ways are humans going to be able to be even more human, right? And I think the eternal optimist here, what AI is going to do for us is it's going to let us fly across the country, but then walk through like a city center on the other side of it and connect more deeply with humanity. That's the best analogy I've heard of it so far. Coin that, write it. If you haven't written it, put it out there. That is awesome. Yeah, I've heard lots of different ones and I think about communication, but yeah. And then there's the rocket ship part of that too that we didn't really get to, but you know, that's another form of transportation, but a select few people are doing. And there's going to be a few people that push the boundary like that with AI too. Right. Well, we couldn't walk to the moon. Right. Well, it's going to take us places we couldn't have gone, but that doesn't mean on the other side of it, we're also not going to get out and walk on the moonscape, right? It's, it's, yeah, absolutely. I love it. Well, so tell us real quick, where can people find out more about you and their work of CS for All? And, it, and by the way, does this all cost thousands of dollars? What is it? <laughs> no, come and join us at CS for All. We actually have a membership of over 900 organizations and researchers. Uh, your school district can come and join for free, csforall.org, uh, as well as browse our membership portal. We've got tons of resources, great members like Rex Academy who have curriculum and professional development for teachers, lots of information about artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and all kinds of the flavors of computer science that you might want to put into the K-12 pathways you're doing. And if you're really struggling to think about how do you build a great K-12 pathway in your school, come and check out our script program. We'll help you set a vision and then build a computer science program that lives to that. Uh, And we really, really hope to see you around. Uh, We're hosting our national summit in October, which will also be live streamed. So if you can't come and join us in Oakland, California, you can watch online uh, and stay tuned. Lots of great stuff coming. Leanne, thank you so much for joining us and for all the great work you do to bring computer science to every student in the country. Uh, You are a gem. I've learned a lot from you during this 20 minutes. Um, Thank you again for being a part of this. And I want to thank everyone else for joining us to the Let's Talk Computer Science podcast and our friends at Rex Academy, of course, for making this podcast possible. Be sure to check out their platform at rex.academy. We all know that technology will be a part of our future. And as educators and leaders, it's our role to make sure all, just like Leanne said, all of our students have an opportunity in that future as well. This is Carl Hooker signing off.